Hello and welcome to our webinar about the Abstra Operating System AOS Release 1.1. I am Jonathan Garzon, Head of Product Management at Abstra, and I am joined today by Derek Winkworth, Abstra's Network Engineer in Residence, also known as, as CloudToad on Twitter. Today we're going to give you an overview of some of the exciting new features in 1.1 with an emphasis on how AOS can help you today design, deploy, and operate your data center network. And we will particularly focus on what we call rack-oriented data center design. Derek will start explaining how modern networks are built today and how rack-oriented networking helps standardize and simplify the network lifecycle. The presentation will go for about 30 minutes, and then we will answer questions for about 15 minutes. We recommend that you watch the presentation in full screen mode. Please send us your questions as, uh, at any point during the presentation using the form right below the presentation screen. And feel free to ask as many questions as you want. We really like questions. You'll also notice that there is a rating tab right below the presentation screen. Please rate this webinar so that we can improve our future events. OK, before handing it over to Derek, let me start with a short introduction of Abstra and describe who we are and what we do. Abstra was founded on the mission to drastically simplify the way data center networks are designed, built, and operated, delivering on a vision of a self-operating network. We have assembled an extremely talented team with expertise across data center networking, distributed systems, abstraction, and automation, and with a proven track record in creating and leading successful businesses. Our product, AOS, is the first distributed operating system for the data center network. It runs on top of your hardware infrastructure and delivers full intent-driven, closed-loop, vendor-agnostic network lifecycle automation. We'll get into more details about what this all means. We believe that ultimately most customers will be able to design, build, and operate their data center networks using our turnkey certified reference designs with minimal customization. In fact, we like to use the analogy that AOS is like a game console into which you insert specific cartridges for specific use cases. We provide these cartridges and let you customize them to your needs. In, in 1.1, we already support a variety of use cases out of the box using a modern two-stage L3 class reference design. For example, you can connect your server using L2 connectivity, including lag and mlag, or even deploy AOS agents onto the servers to manage routed BGP L3 connectivity. These options are great for data center designs that use application, deploy as bare metal, VMs, uh, or even containers. In this presentation, Derek will focus on rack and pod-oriented design, uh, new capability introduced in 1.1. So with that, let me hand over the floor to Derek Winkworth. Derek. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, like Jonathan said, I'm Derek Winkworth. I'm also known as at CloudToad on Twitter, so please follow me as well as our uh, website at Abstra Inc. Uh, on, on Twitter. So we're going to talk a little bit about racks and pods in general first, uh, why people use them and what the benefits of doing that, uh, of, of thinking about networking in these terms uh, is. So the reason why people would want to do this is largely because it's repeatable. And with repeatability comes predictability. And with predictability comes operational simplicity and scale. It's really kind of that simple. So what is rack-oriented networking? We'll get to pods in a second. Well, in talking to customers, we really got the impression that there's two general approaches, at least from a network uh, point of view. On the left, we see a, a rack that just has two switches in it. And if you're doing rack-oriented networking and you're sort of on this minimalist end of the spectrum, then when you think, I have the standardized rack that I'm going to deploy uh, when I'm building out my infrastructure, then you're, you know what housing you're going to use, the actual rack itself, uh, the power arrangement, the number of switches, maybe the switch vendor, all of that is kind of already known. Uh, console access, and like some minimal set of VLANs, like a management VLAN, for instance. 
And then whatever else goes into that rack happens over time and is sort of ad hoc. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, when what we hear from customers is that they have these pre-configured racks that have server and storage, uh, maybe routers, um, uh, basically a whole list of sort of things that, that are already pre-populated in the rack when, when they order it. Right? So BCE, for instance, sells these pre-populated, uh, if you will, hyper-converged racks or, or you know, whatever they call them. And they contain, you know, so many CPUs and so many uh, terabytes of storage, let's say. <clears throat> so that's generally, you know, what people mean when, when they say rack-oriented. Um, they're probably coming from one of these two perspectives. And they use these racks to build pods. And chances are your data center is made of pods. Uh, we again, we talk to a lot of customers, and <clears throat> what we hear is that uh, well, at least some of them think that their their network is very uniform. But when we get into the details about how their network is built, we see that there's like a section of the network over here and a, another one over here. And we ask them, well, what's this for and what's that for? And they'll say, oh, well, we built out you know this little section of the network. It's an isolated VMware pod for some application. Or we built this pod out because you know it's there was an acquisition and we integrated that application into our infrastructure. Um, or they'll have a section uh, that's uh, built out that's like a, a different vendor. For instance, uh, their whole data center is mostly Cisco, but they'll have an Arista pod uh, built out. There could be a whole variety of reasons why they have these little pods inside their network. And one of the characteristics uh, of these pods is that um, there's a lot of variation between them. I mean, besides just the vendor from a network perspective, there could be differences in how the servers are attached to the leads, like, um, you know, in terms of redundancy. Different numbers of, in this case, uh, we're talking about two-stage L3 clause. There could be a different number of spines, a different number of leads, different arrangements of uplinks. But in any case, they have these, their, their data center really is sort of broken into these little pods. And there's a benefit to doing your, net, your data center in this way. Um, the, the first thing is that um, it increases stability and, and that's kind of related to, you know, there's better fault isolation. If, if something blows up inside of a pod, it's usually contained within that pod and doesn't impact the entire network. At least that's that's the hope. <laughs> um, it's generally more scalable to build out uh, your data center in, in a sort of modular way. Plus, you can customize these. Again, all that variation, you can customize these pods um, exactly as needed per application or, or per deployment. Mm -hmm. And it really is um, probably the best way to do a multi-vendor strategy. At least um, it's, it's the best way to do it for the first time. So let's talk a little bit about using racks as uh, the building blocks to build pods inside of AOS version 1.1. Inside of AOS, there's, there's three overall steps. First, we, we create what we call logical devices. From these logical devices, uh, we create different rack types. And from these rack types, we go on to create a design template. Uh, basically, we're, we're designing our pod using the racks as building blocks. We're going to go into each of these steps in a, a slightly more detail uh, next. So what are logical devices? Well, a logical device describes a collection of Ethernet ports that are on something. For instance, a switch, right? A switch may have 48 Ethernet ports. If you were to so uh, on the on the <clears throat> slide here, we see on the top we have uh, an Ethernet switch um, being represented as 24 ports, and these ports have roles. Uh, 20 of these ports are designated to connect to servers, and four of them are designated to connect to spine switches. Below that, we see uh, a server that has four ports, and these ports are designated to connect to leaf switches. 
And on top of the number of ports and the roles, uh, logical devices also define um, the port speeds. So once we have some number of logical devices defined, we use those logical devices uh, to build racks. And so here we have uh, the, you know, the abstract representation on the left, uh, two Ethernet switches, and four servers. And there's other parameters um, you can configure when you're defining these rack types. For instance, you can define how the servers are attached to the leads. Uh, up on the left-hand, up uh, the upper left corner, we see a, a server that's just single connected to a leaf switch. Next to that, um, we see a server that's dual connected with lag, potentially. Then we see on the bottom left quadrant, M lag. And then on the bottom right quadrant, we see uh, a, a server that's M lag across two leaves with a lag to each leaf. And just to be clear, even though these switches are side by side in this depiction, these would be, these, these are all contained in the same rack. The next thing you can define within the rack are rack local virtual networks or VLANs. So here we have uh, a management VLAN and a compute VLAN defined inside the rack. And again, those are rack local, meaning they will not span uh, the L3 clause that this rack is attached to. Once we have some number of rack types defined, then we can actually design our pod. And we see here at the top, two, uh, the two purple blocks, those are logical devices that represent spine switches. Then we have some number of uh, racks underneath of differing types. We see um, also we can define here the number of uplinks between each rack type and the spine link. So some of the racks have four uplinks, some have two. And we also see that we've defined a rack which has connectivity uh, to the broader network. That's part of the pod design is, of course, how does the pod connect to your broader network? And uh, the rack on the right is connecting to your DC or WAN edge. So, so far uh, in all of this definition, we haven't actually specified any particular vendor or network operating system um, for the network devices. And the, at the time of implementation, once a network design is done, um, the person doing the implementation can, can choose from any number of network devices that were mapped to, the logical, to a given logical device inside of the pod design. So for instance, um, you can, for this one logical device on this slide, uh, there are three mappings to a Cisco switch, an Arista switch, and a Juniper switch. And what that means is, at the time of implementation, you could choose any one of those devices to implement uh, the network. And also during maintenance operations, um, let's say you had a switch go bad and uh, you didn't have another of the same switch, let's say it was you know, a Cisco switch, but the only thing you had in your closet is an Arista switch. Well, if that Arista switch has a mapping to that logical device, you could swap, uh, you could put that Arista switch in in place of that Cisco switch, and it would be transparent to the user. Uh, in fact, you wouldn't even have to touch the CLI. That's really cool. That is very cool, actually. Uh, that's one of our better demos that we like to give. So we have one recorded from the NFD events, by the way. We do. Yeah, we do. So uh, another interesting thing about this slide is uh, on the right-hand side, we, you see we support Linux meaning you can actually um, extend AOS, the distributed operating system, all the way into the hypervisor of a host, or you know, if it's not um, a virtualized host, into, the, into a bare metal host. And we can manage uh, BGP and uh, lag or MLAG um, from the server side, including collecting telemetry um, on those things. We also support Cumulus, and uh, that means that we, um, uh, it's very easy for us to support just about any hardware that Cumulus runs on. So let's talk about use cases.
with this network design, we sort of we have this very interesting forwarding paradigm. We have layer three routing between the leaf and the spine, and consequently from leaf to leaf. But within each rack, we have an isolated layer two domain. So earlier I showed a slide that had a management VLAN and a compute VLAN. Um, so we see the same thing repeated here, and you see these VLANs repeated across each rack. Each instance of that blue VLAN um, will have the same VLAN number, and that's and that's possible because, of course, the VLAN doesn't span the L3 clause. And it's not a coincidence that these features we've introduced in 1.1 allow you to design this kind of network because this kind of network is actually very ubiqu ubiquitous and well-known. If you go out to any number of vendor websites, uh, VMware uh, or project websites like OpenStack, um, think, uh, Hortonworks, Cumulus, uh, Cisco, Arista, every single one of them, actually, there are many, many projects uh, and, and tons of design guides and uh, design breakout sessions and presentations and stuff like that from different events that have L3 clause with rack local VLANs as a recommended design. In VMware, for instance, uh, you could implement uh, NSX over top of this design using with rack local VLANs for vMotion, VXLAN, storage, and a management VLAN. And depending on, on your configuration, there could be other VLANs in there. According to the NSX design guide, this is actually the preferred solution. And you'll find variations of the same design in, in all of these things. So what AOS does for the engineer is it allows the engineer to express their intent through the user interface. That intent is distilled down into uh, a source of truth or like a database of truth. From that truth model, two things are, are built. First, uh, the configurations uh, are rendered from this model of the truth down to the devices that constitute um, the network. The second thing um, that, that comes from this model of the truth is uh, a second model of the expected state of the network. And what this is, it's a list of specific telemetry relevant to what the network engineer is designing and what that telemetry should look like for the particular network that they're deploying. So when they deploy that network, whatever vendor they're using, whatever, however many spines or leaves or uplinks, the <clears throat> AOS will generate and push down the configurations uh, onto, onto those devices and then with, their, with the AOS agent that's co-resident on those boxes, uh, we also support agents um, off box, uh, the specific telemetry will be harvested on a continuous basis and, and sent up to the AOS server where it's compared against the ex what the expected state of the network is. Ongoing and forever. It's like having a network engineer that never sleeps uh, looking at your network. And we do this for the different pods inside of your data center, whether it's one pod or many pods, um, AOS can, uh, can manage those pods for you. We said it would be uh, concise, short and sweet. So that was the, the presentation. There are actually uh, some other features we introduced inside of uh, with version 1.1, some customization features allows you to customize the configurations that are pushed down to those devices. Um, we also introduced uh, UI enhancements. And of course, for all of these rack and pod oriented features, we introduced um, a whole bunch of telemetry uh, um, that's, you know, that, that you can look at uh, when you're troubleshooting um, the network and that telemetry is used by the system itself to validate um, the state of the network. So with that, thank you, Derek. Um, that was a very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, we do have several questions from the audience that came up. Um, let me let me rank those. Um, one first question is, 
can you give a specific example of what you call intent? Sure. The, the idea behind intent is we don't want to be overly prescriptive. Uh, right now, when a network engineer uh, designs a network, um, they are very, very prescriptive from, from the design of the topology down to the, the choice of switch model all the way down to how the devices are configured. And the idea behind intent is you don't have to be that prescriptive. So it's declarative instead. It's declarative. That's exactly right. You can, you can for instance, uh, say I want a network with that'll support or a pod network that'll support a thousand servers and has this oversubscription ratio uh, and has this redundant. Uh, redundancy characteristics between the servers and the leaf nodes. And from that high-level description, AOS can uh, essentially uh, design the network, uh, render the configurations, and start collecting telemetry in order to deliver on that intent. So you never have to describe which BGP sessions should be established or any of the details that support this behavior that you that you want from the from the system. That's exactly right. Sounds great. Um, another question is, do you plan to support VXLAN? And actually, that's something that I, I can take on, and, and you would add if, if uh, anything. Um, this is a great this is a great question that a lot of our customers are asking. And, and yes, we plan to support VXLAN. Uh, we've started really with um, underlay network automation because uh, we thought this was something that was well underserved in the networking area, and also because that was foundational. Um, to deliver on this vision of a self-operating network. We need to start with the basis. And we deliver that. The infrastructure we put together make it very easy and natural to, um, to add new functionalities, uh, as I described in the beginning of this presentation, as, as new cartridges or use cases that we, that we add. And we're looking, obviously, at virtualization as one of them, isolation, um, but also managing load balancing and security aspects of the data center to really make it autonomous and self-operating. So stay tuned. All right. Um, Anything to add to that? Yeah, actually, it's interesting. Uh, somebody just asked, um, are all Junos features supported, eVPN, for example? And that sort of fits into what you were just talking Absolutely. about. Um, we don't support all features on all boxes um, out of the gate. Our approach to developing support inside of our product is to identify um, use cases uh, and and sort of best practice designs, and then and then supporting the features required to deploy those designs. Um, if there are features that you need, for instance, storm control that are not explicitly um, supported by uh, you know through the user interface, we have we provide a number of ways that you can customize those uh, configurations when they're pers uh, pushed down. For instance, we introduced a feature called configlets that would allow you to apply storm control to um, you know, any number of interfaces uh, using, um, I'm not going to say regex because that's too complicated, but you can, for instance, use uh, splat to say something like interface star, you know, whatever the command is, storm control, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and then when that config gets rendered, storm control, that little configlet will be pushed down to those interfaces. So um, while we don't necessarily support all features through the, through the UI, we, we support the main ones needed for the use case. You can customize those configurations for the features that you want. Great. We have a series of questions coming up. Um, on um, So I'd like to tie up a few questions. One of them is, does AOS need to be installed on every switch or device? And I'd like to tie this up with um, questions like, do you have plans to support Cisco IOS? In addition to NXOS, I think there is a few questions about different OS support and, and devices. I think we can we can answer this. Yeah, we, we can combine the yeah. answer to those. Um, AOS does not have to be installed on the device uh, directly. Of course, it's recommended that way because um, we we actually generate and stream telemetry off the box, and so it's I mean the best possible way to deploy AOS is by in fact installing it on the platforms that. Uh, uh, support that. However, um, you know we have customers with, uh, for instance, Cisco IOS, and uh, <clears throat> obviously that those some of those platforms do not support installing agents on their box. So 
we also support uh, what we call proxy agents. It's in fact um, an agent, it's exactly the same agent except um, it sits off box and communicates with the device through any number of means, um, SNMP, NetConf, and um, even expect and, and screen scraping, whatever is required um, you know, to gather the right telemetry and, and to get the configs uh, pushed down on, onto the device. Yeah, so our infrastructure make it very easy to introduce support for new OS models and devices. And today, this is a function that is provided by um, a team internally that, that we call customer enablement team that actually builds and customizes those, um, those uh, agents for new devices. Uh, on the roadmap, we're looking at making that um, part of an SDK that would allow anybody, a partner or, or a customer, to actually build and introduce functionality, functionality for a new device. So we have, uh, we have a lot uh, ahead of us on this side. Um, next question that's coming, that is coming from the audience, what does the roadmap look like? Will networks beyond the data center be tackled? Campus, WAN, et cetera. Uh, I, can, I can take a stab at that. Um, so first we see, uh, we see more and more campus uh, being built as uh, L3 class. So using a data center design. And we have a few opportunities actually that are in that, in that space. Uh, in general, as, as we described in the beginning, we're, we're, we're really looking at um, use cases as being um, another cartridge or application that, that AOS will support. We have certainly decided to focus, to focus on the, for, for the, the, this first um, version of AOS on data center design and, and uh, why the infrastructure supports um, the, the ability to uh, extend the usefulness uh, and the applicability of AOS to when and other aspects of the network, we are really trying to do a good a job at uh, addressing the data center needs to start with. Anything to add on this? Nope. <laughs> no, just, yeah. At the moment, we're, we're trying to um, develop, you know, complete use cases around the things that we're targeting. Um, this is version 1.1. We launched uh, version 1.0 back in June. So I think once we start, um, you know, reaching a point where we have, um, uh, you know, these really uh, feature rate rich and, and uh, super diverse uh, range of, um, you know, data center use cases, then we'll start uh, looking at other other use cases. But you're right. If if you're, uh, we're seeing more and more customers who want L3 clause in their campus, which I, I can, I'm, to be honest, I, I wasn't expecting that. I think that's a really cool way to approach that. So um, certainly uh, there's nothing in the tool that limits you to deploying, um, you know, the, all these supported networks um, anywhere, you know, whether it's in the data center or, or, or campus. So um, there's certainly a multitude of use cases. And if you're, uh, and to be clear, if you're looking at a project now, like, deploying NSX with layer three vMotion. Um, and, you know, yet you should be aware that the preferred design is L3 clause. Um, you can use AOS today to make that very simple, along with a number of other use cases. Yeah, to come back on the campus uh, use of L3 clause, what I'm hearing from the market is that uh, more and more campus are built to provide connectivity, not only to employees, uh, on the on the on the on the seven hour a day per per day basis, but also to IoT equipment and devices that needs to always uh, have the network to communicate together. Uh, elevators and sensors and lights are all relying on the network, and and you now expect the same level of re reliability of your network of your campus network that you have in in uh, in your data center. That's exactly that's right. Actually, uh, that's one of the reasons why L3 um, clause designs are are becoming more popular in, in terms of campus networks is because there are actually way more IoT devices than there are users in a building, um, sometimes by like an order of magnitude. There's actually a question here. It says, when you say an agent is installed, do, do we do that manually or is it pushed through some automated mechanism? That's a great question. That is a great question because, um, as a matter of fact, Abstra, um, in addition to a, the, the core AOS uh, product, our customer enablement team has produced a set of tools, some of which have been open sourced, um, that sort of sit around the edge of the product and they're there to help people 
um, get more stuff done in less time with less risk and to integrate the product with uh, other things. So for instance, um, uh, we have a universal ZTP server that's open source. It works with every vendor that we support and it allows you to be, essentially put um, your device into the rack uh, and power it on and our ZTP server will put the right version of code on there and the agent onto the device uh, and then and then the device will automatically register to AOS. The other thing um, <coughs> Uh, but in fact, let me let me add here that um, this code is available on GitHub at github.com slash abstract. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can go look at that right now. And we are just now starting to get a community around it. Um, you can use the ZTP server um, without AOS, uh, but certainly when you combine it with AOS, AOS, it becomes very powerful. We had another question um, on here about do you have, um, do we have access to the telemetry streaming off of the uh, devices? And the answer is you do, actually. All of the telemetry that's scraped off those devices and streamed back to the server um, can be streamed in turn from the server to things like Influx uh, and Grafana and, you know, whatever whatever it is you want to uh, stream it to. If I, and all of that's encoded in uh, Google Protobufs, and uh, there are some examples up on the same GitHub repository of this. All right. We have a of questions coming, let me select another one. Please do so. Um, uh, what is the best supported white box models for direct installation? Edge core. I mean, there's a few. There, there's a list of questions. I'd say that we have we have a we have a list of white boxes um, uh, su uh, devices that are supported. They're all listed in our uh, hardware compatibility list. I want to hide so so we'll, we'll get into. Um, you'll find that information on our website. I want to highlight the fact that we were two days ago at uh, at, uh, at an event, Facebook private event called Disaggregate, where we were actually demonstrating demonstrating AOS support on top of the Wedge 100, which is the latest uh, release of um, of Facebook um, um, device, OCP yeah. Open. We were doing that device. in conjunction with SnapRoute. Absolutely. Um, so that's that's uh, we're we're really trying to ease the adoption of uh, white box in, in networking. Oh, here's a good question. Are you seeing after use more in new builds or existing networks? So it's actually um, a combination, and we and internally we've had these really um, I'm going to say inane arguments about what to call this. Uh, certainly, there are greenfield deployments um, that are that after is being uh, used to support, but um, we we were trying to come up with a word. Uh, one of them is like green patch. And I guess um, referring back to the presentation, um, if you're putting in a new pod in an existing network, you can use AOS um, to help you deploy that uh, pod, right? And, and think about this for a second. If, if, uh, you, if your existing network is you know, largely L2 based or like an older network design, um, or um, let's say it's not, but you want to, you know, you want to deploy this new pod, but you want to try something new. You want to try Cumulus at the edge, and after is this, or excuse me, Arista is the spine. Um, you could use AOS to do this, uh, and then all you have to do is, is design, deploy the network, and then, and then of course in that design you would configure how it uplinks into your existing network. So it's yes, certainly you can do greenfield, but you can also do green patch um, with, with AOS. All right, a question. Is it possible to support L3 PGP directly on the host like some vendors do support, like Cumulus routing on the host? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, I, I hinted at this in the presentation. Um, AOS, the AOS agent um, can be installed on Linux to manage both lag, mlag, and BGP automatically. So we basically have an agent on the, on the server that's on the, on the switch that control um, the BGP uh, connectivity and down to the servers to and, and control the Quagga stack that that uh, through which we inject slash 32s. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Well, when when you deploy that agent, uh, well, there's two deployment scenarios with that. You can deploy that agent, uh, like for instance, um, if it's a bare metal host, you you can do that and you can route um, IPs off the box um, that way. Or if you're using containers, you can um, uh, create host routes for the containers. Um, that are on that box and inject them into the fabric. That's pretty cool. Um, all right, let's select another question. 
So one question is, uh, what do you mean by vendor agnostic? Is that the same thing as multi-vendor? Uh, that's actually a very good question. Um, so <clears throat> when I was when I was a network engineer, I've heard vendors say our product is multi-vendor. Um, I don't even know how many times, and it really wasn't multi-vendor. Like they they mostly largely supported one vendor, and they had this sort of peripheral support for for a limited number of other devices from other vendors, and and they never supported all the same functionality as they did for for the other vendor. Uh -huh. And even when um, you know you talk to when you, when you look at products that are made by in a, um, a company that manufactures hardware, they'll say, oh yeah, well this this time for real it's multi vendor, but the product doesn't even support all the models that that equipment manufacturer makes, and so that there's that problem. And the, and the other problem is a lot of times what vendor multi vendor really means is that they have an overly um, simplified like device abstraction that makes you know whatever makes um, a particular switch model special. This overly simple device abstraction um, you know makes makes those benefits inaccessible, right? It's I think they call it um, the, it's like a least common denominator problem, and when we say vendor agnostic, we sort of, what we actually mean is vendor inclusive. And and the way we do that is we don't have that, we don't have a device abstraction like that. It's actually, those device abstractions are actually a terrible idea. Not only, because on one end they can be overly simple, but on the other end, if they start trying to incorporate lots and lots of features from lots and lots of vendors, those device abstractions become monstrous and buggy. So we just eliminated um, the concept of the device abstraction from our design, uh, from the product design. And, and what this allows you to do is you can choose vendors for their strengths. If, if um, for instance, you can deploy Hadoop on top of uh, Arista because Arista has some really, really cool integrations with, um, with different Hadoop platforms. And, and you can uh, leverage those things with AOS through our customizations and our uh, extensibility uh, features. So the way I like to put it is that we, we completely decoupled the, the service and operational models from vendor specificity. So it allows you really, without changing anything the way you do operate your network to select the best best fit vendor uh, for the specific use case that you want to um, to use use the pod for yep. uh, and switch to any vendor at any time. Yep, and I think we're the only company that does that. It. I agree. Um, next question. Are you guys planning on an integration with any offerings from Big Switch? Um, <laughs> we we actually know a lot of those guys over there, and we would love to do that integration. Um, if if you have a use case um, for that, or if you if that's something you would like to see, uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to talk about that. That we think they have some excellent offerings, and uh, it would be it would be really cool to see an integration there. All right. Next question: Do you have a plan or capability to automatically extract the model from an existing network um, net, network configure network config that customer is happy with? Uh, then use your closed loop telemetry to help with ongoing operation of the existing config. So. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll answer that. Go ahead. Um, so <clears throat> the answer to that is um, yes and no. We do have customers that use our product for the telemetry only. Um, they they want the streaming telemetry from an existing network, and so they that's what they want to use our product for. And it is possible to use our product in telemetry only mode for an existing network. Um, we don't at at this time we don't. Um, model uh, what we what we would consider an ad hoc network, uh, but um, I think there are features coming up. Jonathan can yeah, speak to that allow that kind of modeling. Absolutely, and but that's also uh, what uh, our customer enablement team would do: uh, come into an existing network and model, come up with a model of a network that we can use that we can use to um, to to assess um, uh, its behavior and the, and the telemetry, extract telemetry, and validate that against expectation. Um, what I want to say, though, is that the real value or the, the, the power of, of AOS is really this closed loop and the idea that configuration should be derived from intent as well as telemetry expectation. So we really, we, 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 have, we want to use 
offer this telemetry first mode as a way to um, to introduce AOS into a network. But the reality, the real, the real benefit is going to to be when you have uh, AOS do the configuration management as well, because we can really um, close the loop. Okay. We, and we actually have uh, um, a lot of very interesting features on our roadmap, which of course are, you know, you have to have an NDA to hear those, um, if, uh, in which we really enhance what that closed loop can do. And um, if any of you are interested, again, if any of you are interested in hearing um, and how this product is going to evolve, please reach out to us. We'd love, first of all, to hear what your use cases are, and we'd love, you know, we love sharing uh, what the vision is and where we're going with this because we're all network engineer geeks here and it's something we're all very excited about. All right, question coming from the audience. How do you see your product adopted in an environment where some other solution already in use? Um, and I guess that refers to either scripting solutions or other products that do some of what we're doing. Um, we, we really see we really see there's a few solutions that do part of what AOS does in terms of either configuration management or telemetry reporting, but really nothing in the market currently um, provides um, these three attributes that we put on the table, which are intent driven, vendor agnostic, uh, and closed loop. And um, the, the closest solution that exists uh, in, in, in the markets, which are not really in the market, are, are the ones that have been built by hyperscale uh, cloud providers. Um, using hundreds of engineers and years of, of uh, research and, and development. Uh, what AOS is really about is, is bringing that, that, those capabilities as commercial software to, um, to, to, to the market. Uh, and so as such, we don't see ourselves competing with any of these solutions. We're really uh, integrating with those solutions and providing a value on top of what exists, uh, the solution that exists today. All right. Um, we're at the end of the time, so so we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for um, for your time. Um, Derek, thank you for the great presentation. If we didn't have time to get your questions, we will definitely follow up with you by email shortly. Uh, reminder, please rate the webinar, so we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, otherwise, I hope that we're able to help you grasp the power uh, of the Abstract Operating System and how it can make uh, it can make your lives easier. Uh, you can learn more about AOS through the resources we've attached to this webinar. We've actually posted some uh, some links, uh, including the the link to Derek's presentation at the NFD event. Uh, awesome, awesome video, Jeremy and you. The AOS architecture overview white paper and David Cheriton's white paper on the distributed network challenge. Of course, there is much more information on our web website www.abstra.com. And in particular, in our blog. So I really encourage you to subscribe there. Uh, and last, please, please subscribe and follow us on, uh, on, on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Google+. Uh, yeah, and again, rate this webinar, please. Thank you all again for attending today. Uh, we're, look for, we're looking forward to hearing from you and seeing you on the next webinar. With that, have a great day. Thank you. Derek, thank you, everybody. <laughs>